Howdy folks, Michael with the Reason RX Podcast. Here again, 23 May 2021. Hope you are doing well. So we're still in this quarantine thing. If you're listening in the future, fun. But uh, we'll see what happens, where things are going to go in the next few months and in the fall when the winter rolls around. All this fun, political, social, educational stuff going on, all these cultural movements, all these philosophical movements, people trying to influence the culture in different ways, stuff going on in politics. Um, great time to be alive. Where? Okay. Um, maybe not in some ways. Some ways, obviously, it's great. We got this stuff going. Podcasts, all this other great stuff. But um, in some ways, not. But hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you could remember, if you could give it some thumbs up, give it some likes, leave some good comments, or just thrash it. Say, they talk about reason. Reason's stupid. Who cares about reason? What does reason have to do with education? They need to talk about, like, your big toe or your feelings. Important stuff in education. You can just trash or leave comments or whatever you want to do. But, and spread the word. Let teachers, principals, others know about the podcast, the show, a lot of good ideas that would influence our culture for the better. Um, and if you can support it, that would be appreciated. There's like links to PayPal and something or other in there, in the show notes. But, um, today... We are going to talk to Hans Schantz about scouting. So, in education, we got some principles that we must obey, but then we got different parameters that we can vary on. Every child is individual and unique and has their own needs, but they are human. So there's some things that are on principle the same for everyone, like it or not, no matter what you believe, end of story. But obviously, we have some different interests, different goals that are valid within a rational context, um, different careers you want to prepare for. People like different colors, different food. They wear different clothes. Um, and there's there can be a different balance of individual work and group work. Um, so we're going to talk today about some ideas we can learn to think about that. How might we do some group work in a productive way instead of it being like some, as people know, a lot of group work, you know, one person ends up doing all the work, the others just tag along and do nothing, just kind of like jump on the train, parasite on the other person, um, get an A from someone else's work. That's not really going to cut it in a company. We need everyone doing the best they can to make the best product, bring a lot of good thinking into play. Um, so it'd be good to learn how we can strive towards doing that, if not actually accomplish it. At least we can do some group work and individual work better. It'll help people have ideas, see how you can balance it, when you can do what, maybe at what age some things are appropriate. So we'll get into talking about some of that um, with some scouting and some Montessori today. Um, so Hans, could you introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, my name is Hans Schantz. I live in Huntsville, Alabama. I have been involved in scouting with my family for uh, about four or five years now. My boys were Cub Scouts and are now Boy Scouts. Uh, my girls are uh, Venturers, which is cool. a kind of less structured program within scouting that emphasizes uh, outdoor adventures and activities without the all the structure that Boy Scouting provides. And there's also, so there's Scouts, Venturers, and there's also what, like Sea Scouts? Uh, yeah, there is Sea Scouts, which is, well, as you might imagine, a nautical-themed uh, scouting program that uh, uh, works on things like sailing and water safety. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been involved in Scouts? Uh, I've been in uh, about four or five years. I started just bringing my boys to their Cub Scout meetings 
and the uh, their den leader asked me to step up and help, and I kind of enjoyed getting involved in that side of the thing. Uh, I had some past experience in teaching. Uh, I went through a graduate program in physics where I taught uh, physics to undergraduates, and then I spent a couple of years in education teaching electronics and math and physics at the community college level. So you know, I, I've enjoyed being involved in education, and scouting really was an opportunity to uh, do more of the same, get involved in the curriculum and the education and the experience that uh, my children were receiving through scouting. So I, I started off as a uh, assistant den leader and uh, ended up being the cub master for the pack. So that meant I was in charge of the overall uh, program for the pack, organizing pack campouts, and uh, you know making sure that the individual dens were staying on track and following the the curriculum. Uh, the curriculum is, uh, uh, on the Cub Scout level, is pretty structured each year. There are four or five activities that the Cub Scouts have to complete in order to earn their rank, and then a wide variety of optional activities. Uh, there are uh, campouts, uh, a half dozen or so campouts over the course of the year, lots of outdoor activities. Uh, the real point of Cub Scouts is that uh, it's a game, but in the words of uh, Lord Baden Powell, who is the founder of Scouting, it's a game with a purpose. So mm -hmm. it's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be the kinds of things that uh, boys like to do, but that they learn important life lessons like teamwork and uh, character and the value of hard work and being able to work together in a team. Scouting is a lot more uh, collective than, say, a Montessori education would mm -hmm. be. Uh, the boys are working together usually on most of their activities. If they're you know, working individually, it's as part of an overall group activity, like at a camp out. Uh, one boy might be in charge of cooking and another in charge of a hike. You know, they'll divvy up the responsibilities, but they're all working together to pull off the overall program. Mm -hmm. now, on the Cub Scout level, it's adult led. So really the adults are running the show. Uh, they're making the decisions. They're laying out the program and kind of letting the, the kids help out and uh, participate and have fun without really having the responsibility of making it all happen. At the Boy Scout level, that switches, and it becomes a boy-led program. So the, uh, the boys in the troop are the ones responsible for uh, planning out the program and executing the program. The older boys will, will step up and take charge and organize the younger boys. So the more experienced boys, when they get into an activity, will be teaching and guiding the younger boys. And I think that's just a great way to uh, you know, educate and learn about any subject. I know in uh, my background in physics, I never really understood a lot of the physics in my uh, uh, you know, classes until it was my responsibility to have to be able to explain yeah. it, and answer all the questions. You always learn more when you are called upon to teach the subject than you did when you're sitting back passively on the receiving side trying to learn from someone else. So, and some, the, the, like Aristotle said, those who know do, those who understand teach. As opposed to, who is that doofus, Bernard Shaw, who said, those who can do, those who can't teach. Um, as I said in a previous podcast, tell that to Bruce Lee. Great practitioners, teachers, you know, are like Richard Feynman and Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Everyone who knows Bruce Lee knows he was quintessentially a teacher. Um, and Feynman, he was Nobel Prize winning physicist great physicist, but regarded as one of the great physics teachers of the 1900s, if not the great. Um, yeah, so 
Well, it, it's very interesting, though, because particularly at the university level, you get um, a, a really pernicious attitude of, oh, we're not going to spoon feed them. We're going to make them learn themselves and just kind of throw material out without making the effort to work back through the links and the connections and the process uh, and you'll know, recapitulate the process of how you learned it so mm -hmm. that other people can learn it. Yeah. And that, if that was, if that was done in junior high school or high school, then it'd be fine. Then you could throw it at college kids. So you figure it out because they'd already know the methods, but to never teach them that and then expect them to do something they've never learned. That's like illogical, you know? Well, well, th there's a lot of that on the university level yeah. in my experience. And unfortunately it's, it's a side effect of – it's basically a process of trying to turn laziness into a virtue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, in, in scouting, it, uh, you know, nothing will get done unless the boys are doing it. Mm -hmm. So you know, they have the incentive of, well, you want to go uh, out camping this weekend? Well, you're going to have to get together and plan out. Uh, you know, where are you going to go and what activities are you going to do and who is going to bring the food and uh, who is going to cook the food and what is going to be on the menu? And, you know, the, the boy who is in charge of cooking and decides, oh, I'm just going to have pop tarts for breakfast is going to hear it from his patrol mates when the other patrol is eating like scrambled eggs and bacon <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, ha having a, a, a tastier breakfast. So yeah. it, it's a it's a good experience. And so. In Cub Scouts, they have dens, and in Boy Scouts, they have troops. Um, what's well, the, what, what's in Cub Scouts, the age-grouped uh, uh, teams of boys are called dens, and they all of the dens taken together are a pack. Mm -hmm. uh, in Boy Scouts, it's patrols, and that's why they call it the patrol method. So a patrol mm -hmm. is a group of you know, typically around eight or nine boys, uh, usually it's a mix of uh, age levels and experience and skills so that you have some older experienced scouts able to teach the younger ones. Uh, we do have, you know, when we take in a whole bunch of new scouts, we'll initially have them in their own patrol so that they are under the guidance of actually an adult as well as some senior scouts getting them up to speed on how Boy Scouts works. But then after the first few months, they're distributed. We, you know, That patrol gets dissolved, and they're distributed as the youngest and newest members of the, the other patrols. Then you'll occasionally have a patrol where it's just the Eagle Scouts who are kind of tired of hanging out with the younger kids and want to do their own thing. So you know, we you know, can let them do, do their thing and pursue uh, more aggressive, adventuresome, kinds of things that uh you know pre-teenagers might not be ready for and what's the age range for cub and boy the cutoff is about 10 or so mm -hmm. cub scouts now they're actually taking kindergartners in they have a program mm -hmm. uh where kindergartners can come in and complete a really easy curriculum and do some fun outdoor activities uh but uh it's effectively kindergarten through about fifth grade about 10 years old uh, is the Cub Scout curriculum. And it's interesting how it covers the same kinds of uh, activities and, and goals each year, but each year the stakes and the requirements and what you have to do get progressively more and more difficult in accordance with their age level. So, you know, each year you're doing things like going out and doing some camping and uh, having to study about citizenship and having to do some work on cooking and having to do, uh, you know, some first aid work and th things like that. And then mm -hmm. each, each year those requirements get more and more aggressive uh, as they get older and more and more capable. You know, so they have to live up to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. And what's this eagle thing you're talking about in the Boy Scouts? Oh, that's, that's at the tail end of the process. You know, when you come in as a Boy Scout, the first few ranks uh you know you once you master the basics and you can say the scout oath and the scout law and you know the pledge of allegiance and have you know answered a bunch of basic questions about what scouting is about you earn scout rank and then the next three ranks tenderfoot second class first class 
are all about mastering basic outdoor and camping skills. Things like uh, first aid and cooking and uh, you know, hiking outdoors and uh, you know, citizenship and uh, there are service hour requirements and things like that. Uh, once you're at first class, you've mastered all of the basics of scouting as a first class scout. And from then on out, the emphasis turns to merit badges. And, you know, that's kind of a fun way of doing it. There are over 100, I think 130 odd merit badges available. There's a yeah, I think group. there's a lot more now than there was when I was in Boy Scouts way back a few <laughs> decades ago. <laughs> Yeah, well, there, there's a core group of about a dozen that are required. Basic mm -hmm. things like citizenship, first aid, emergency preparedness, uh, you know, hiking, uh, physical fitness. You know, th there's a core group that are required in order to be an Eagle Scout. But then you know, there's everything from nuclear physics to astronomy to animal science, insects, textiles, railroading, uh, electricity, uh, you know, just, uh, just an incredible combination of, of possible things you can do. Um, and the next few ranks are, you know, in order to, to move beyond first class and toward Eagle, you have to hold leadership positions within the troop. So you have to step up and be a patrol leader and be the person responsible for organizing the patrol mm -hmm. or be a senior patrol leader and be responsible for organizing the troop overall or be the quartermaster for the troop responsible for all the, the camping gear. So, you know, there, there are a bunch of re, uh, leadership positions you have to hold in order to earn your rank and earn merit badges and do service hours. And the culmination of scouting is to earn the Eagle Scout rank. And in addition to all that other stuff, you have to complete some kind of uh, project your Eagle Scout project has to be something that uh, benefits your community. Uh, it, it cannot benefit scouting. That would be cheating. So you have to come up with some way to do something worthwhile in your community. Recently in our troop, we had one scout who pursued a uh, veterans oral history project, and recorded a whole bunch of veterans talking about cool their memories and, and nice. uh, recollections and services, and he cataloged all of that. That was one of the more interesting and unique ones. Yeah, I bet. Uh, hmm. We've had uh, another scout who uh, restored a howitzer that hmm. was on display at hmm. the uh, uh, Veterans Museum here locally, hmm. uh, doing trail maintenance kinds of things, like uh, where there's a marshy spot on a trail, they'll build a boardwalk for like you know, 50 foot section of boardwalk through the trail or put a bench or build some picnic tables and a shelter. Bird feeders. Uh, for, yeah, th things like that. Uh, yeah, there, there was a conservation project. Uh, some scouts did building some duck boxes out hmm. in a swampy marshy area so the ducks would have some nicer uh, habitat to be in and help enhance the duck population in our local nature preserve. Cool. So all kinds of interesting uh, community, uh, outdoor conservation related projects that uh, you have to complete as an Eagle Scout. It has to be something substantial enough that involves some planning, some fundraising, you know, organizing a team to execute the project and get it done. Those are the kinds of things that they look for in a, an acceptable Eagle Scout project. And then between first class and Eagle, we got star First class, star, life, and then eagle. Right, right. So it's kind of like martial arts where you got the different belts. Yeah, you could you could think of it that way. So part of it is time and rank, but a large part is you also have to have a leadership position and you have to uh, complete a certain number of merit badges and do some, some other community service, like helping other older scouts finish their Eagle Scout projects and uh, clock up some hours that way. Yeah, I think on the local hike bike trails, um, I hear through some of the people who take care of the bike trails, you know, there's official groups, work with the county and all that. They don't just go do whatever they want because it's on some county land, so they got to get permission all this, make sure it's um, 
they're not doing anything they shouldn't. They're not taking up too much land. You got to leave some land, most of the land for the deer, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but try to have no more than twenty percent trail and eighty percent, and then try to have eighty percent wild. But um, scouts, yeah, around here they'll do things like that. Build the boardwalks over some areas, as you say, and <clears throat> excuse me, do some other projects. Um, yeah. And what now? They don't need swimming anymore. I think when I was, do they still need it to get life and eagle? When I was young, I refused to get life or eagle because I hated swimming. And there was no oh. way in heck I was going to get a swimming air badge or life oh, saving. Well, I hated I life saving. You, I, I think you do have to pass the swimming test or have a good medical excuse not to for hmm. first class, I think. But then, uh, Swimming is one of the Eagle required merit badges, but you have your choice between swimming, hiking, or cycling. Hmm. So you could avoid the swimming by doing hiking or cycling instead. Hmm. Yeah, it was different in my time. So, yeah, I only did first class or start. Went to Philmont, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I have heard very good things about Philmont, but I'm, I am going to have to be in better shape because that sounds like it was a heck of a hike. Yeah. Um. You got to make sure your boots are broken in, otherwise you get blisters. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know. <laughs> but you know that those are good experiences. I, yeah. I talked to one of the other adults who led a group at uh, Philmont, and you know the the boys are in charge, so he's looking at his map and realizing they've taken the wrong way. Hmm. And you know he looks, and yeah, they've got enough water; they can probably manage, even though they're not headed to cool. the, the the spring and. You know, turn them loose and let them solve the problem and figure it out. Yeah. And then in some circles, tracking, studying nature, um, I forgot the exact term, but that's called like the coyote method. You ask questions, you get someone to think more on their own instead of telling them the answer. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the required Eagle required merit badges that my boys were involved in, and I, I went and participated in it with them, was the uh, environmental science um, merit badge. And they had to go and basically be a naturalist. Hmm. They went out into a nature preserve and they had to find a study area and describe as much as they could about what, what was going on right then, right there, and then come back a few weeks later and discuss what are the differences, what's happened. Sweet. You know, it it nice. was wet marshy before because it had just rained. Now it's dried out and there's a little more growth and 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 so forth. Cool. That's something that needs to be more in education in general. The... Well, that's that's good because that's forcing them to exercise their skills of observation. Yeah, the basis of science. Description. And that's a key part of scouting. In fact, hmm. um, cool. Baden-Powell, two... two Two uh, uh, scouting stories. When Baden Powell was in, I think it was in India, he was tasked to do espionage. When was that? And what year? Uh, this would have been in probably the 1880s <laughs> or so. But uh, you know, he was off drawing pictures of fortifications, but he very cleverly disguised them as butterflies. <laughs> So he was artistically drawing, you know, how many guns, how many emplacements along the walls, what was the, the military engineering architecture of a fortification. But he did it under the guise of being a kind of silly and dim-witted butterfly fanatic who is drawing all these pictures of butterflies. The Scarlet so, Pimpernel. Yeah, very much <laughs> like that. Another a classic And wait, scouting. one thing for folks. The Scarlet Pimpernel, well, there is a flower with that name, which I learned a few years ago was actually in my area. Um, I didn't know what it was, you know, the movie, The Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, it's a flower, but, um, and a plant, but it's a good movie. I recommend people watch. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, we'll just say that it's a good movie. Um, well, there's, of, there's one other story I wanted to share about but yeah. on the subject of observation. Um, there is a, a classic scouting game called Kim's Game, where what you do is you have a whole bunch of just random items. Usually it's camping gear if you're on an outdoor outing. And 
you lift, uh, you, you put all this, like two dozen or so objects under a blanket and you lift it up and you give them 10 seconds to look at it and then you close it and you ask them to write down and describe what as much of what they saw as they can remember. And usually, you know, they're, they're really lucky to get half or so of the items. But it's a, a good way to, to practice powers of observation and memory for uh, uh, being able to look at something and grasp it and understand it quickly. And then you can teach the power of teamwork by pointing out, hey, you know, there's, uh, there's four of you here. Why don't you each focus on one quadrant of the blanket and what's in that quarter of the space? And working together, they can usually come up with a complete and accurate description of everything that was there. So it's, it's, a, cool. it's a fun group game and activity to help build powers of observation. Cool. Um, did, that, did that give you time to develop your two stories about, um, how do you pronounce his name, Baden-Powell? It's actually pronounced Powell. Powell. But hmm. uh, I, know I, I want to say Powell because it, it certainly looks like that to me. But my understanding is he pronounced it Powell. Hmm. Okay. Um, so now let me see. So up until 10, and then what for Boy Scout, 10 to 18? Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we will often get boys earning their Eagle Scout rank by the time they are 16, even 15, the ones that really hit it hard and have been aggressive about pursuing it. Uh, and then, of course, there's the ones that go to the very last minute and, uh, you know, manage to, to earn it just days before their 18th birthday. You know, the scouting is very strict. Uh, once you pass your 18th birthday, it's too late. And a lot of the requirements have timelines associated with them. Some of the merit badges you have to, uh, you know, track your physical fitness for six or eight weeks or track your personal finances for a certain amount of time. And if you don't get those started early enough and don't finish the process before your 18th birthday, you're out of luck. Hmm. Um, so there are some basics of scouting. Mm -hmm. um, Boy Scouts, First Cub Scouts, the merit badges, the ranking, how you get the different merit badges. Um, do you want to talk something about like the history of scouts? Oh, sure. Yeah, I've, I've alluded a little bit to uh, scouting's founder, uh, Robert Baden Powell. He was a, uh, a university dropout. You know, he applied to Oxford University and didn't get in. Uh, went to a military school instead and found that he really thrived with the the outdoor. Uh, environment involved in the military training. He was sent off to India, uh, really excelled at a very young age. He was promoted to colonel and was responsible for training a lot of troops. And the, the troops were not all that uh, well-educated or well-trained. And he came up, that, that's where he invented the patrol method. <laughs> So where, you know, historically, the military was very hierarchical and the, the ranks were supposed to shut up and do what they were told. He insisted on breaking up uh, the, the troops into patrols, usually led by a non-commissioned officer, and uh, made them engage in those kinds of games and competitions with each, you know, against each other that were designed to help develop their soldiering and scouting skills, you know, their independence. Uh, and it really, uh, it's kind of a precursor to the sort of uh, small unit, like special operations kinds of things mm. that uh, would be done in the military today, where mm. you expect, you know, even the lowest uh, ranks in, of enlisted to exercise their independent judgment, to be capable of making decisions to uh, uh, you know, meet the overall unit orders by exercising their own personal initiative to make whatever piece of it they're responsible for happen. So that's really where he developed a lot of his 
uh, scouting skills and put them into practice and had an opportunity to see how they worked and how you could train people to be better scouts. And he wrote a book, uh, Aids to Scouting, based on that experience that became uh, you know, very, very popular. Well, in the Boer War, he, went, he was sent to South Africa and was ordered to take charge of a settlement called Maif King that came under siege from the, uh, uh, the Boers. And he was able to defend it with you know, very few troops by basically engaging in a whole bunch of clever subterfuges to try to deceive the, the Boers into thinking he had more troops than he actually had. You know, he had his uh, troops stay busy making fake guns from uh, logs. Uh, they would uh, pretend they were stringing barbed wire, which they didn't have, but you know, they'd pound big visible posts into the ground and then pretend they were stringing wire. And then whenever they went through that area, they'd all make a big show of stepping over uh, <laughs> the, the wire that wasn't there. Uh, you know, made a whole bunch of fake landmines and let let his men be observed building minefields, burying these fake landmines everywhere. So, uh, hmm. uh, and, and one of the things that he discovered is that the the boys there were able to be very helpful. You know, if any boy he could enlist to be a messenger or to be an observer or a lookout, uh, well, that was you know one more soldier who was freed up. For actually, you know, doing the the, the fighting and and uh, being ready on the defense, so that really convinced him that boys were capable of doing a lot of the scouting activities that he had taught his troops. So you know, when the siege was finally relieved and he came home to England as a national hero, it brought a lot of attention uh, on him and on his book Aids to Scouting, and a lot of boys were. You know, wanting to play soldier and play scout, and were buying his book and and mm-hmm. doing the the lessons that were were uh, uh, in it. So he uh, he decided as an experiment to uh, uh, you know take a group of boys out with a, a couple of adult leaders and do a couple week camp out and see if you know see how well he could teach them to be independent and to operate as a patrol. And he was just amazed at the success that he had and how far he was able to get the boys in just a couple weeks. And that uh, uh, inspired him to write uh, this book here, uh, which is uh, Scouting for Boys. This is a new reprint of the original 1908 uh, edition. But it's still, it's an excellent read. It has lots of... Uh, great uh, uh, figures in it, uh, like uh, you know, here are scouts building a pioneering structure. So one of the things you learn in cool. scouts is how to take poles and lash them together and build uh, uh, build structures uh, out of them. Uh, and you know, it's full of great great uh, camping and first aid and helpful information. And you know the modern scout handbook descended. From this book here. Well, uh, a couple of years after scouting took hold in uh, the UK, there was an American businessman in London who got lost. And he was standing under a lamp post looking at his map, trying to figure out how the heck he could get back to his hotel when this uh, boy came and, and said, excuse me, sir, can I help you? And uh, he explained he was lost and the boy guided him back to the hotel. And the businessman you know, reached into his pocket and said, here, let me give you, uh, uh, you know, some money for your trouble. And the boy said, oh, no, I can't take a tip. I am a scout and I have an obligation to do a good turn daily. So you know, no tip will be required. That so inspired him and he was so impressed by that young scout that he came back to the U.S. and uh, took the lead in starting Boy Scouts. Now, there had been some... Uh, camp craft, usually Indian-themed boy groups in the U.S. before then, and some of the larger of them merged with Baden-Powell and his scouting organization to form Boy Scouts of America. And this is uh, uh, a modern copy of the uh, original 
Boy Scout, uh, uh, U.S. Boy Scout handbook. So, you know, scouting is in countries all over the world. But, uh, you know, whenever uh, you look at a scout uniform, they'll, there will be some things that are unique to each country and then things that are common. Like one of this is the, the badge for uh, first class scout. And you can see it has the yellow trefoil. That's the universal international symbol of the Brotherhood of Scouting. Now, this is the U.S. Boy Scout, so it has the American eagle uh, superimposed on it to uh, uh, tell you that this is the, the Boy Scouts of America and not of anywhere else. It has two stars on the trefoil for truth and knowledge and to remind us of the stars we use to guide ourselves when we're navigating at night. You can see the, the scout motto below on the ribbon where it says, be prepared, turned up in a smile to remind us that a scout is always cheerful. And at the very bottom, there is a little tiny knot dangling down from that banner. And that uh, knot is to remind us as scouts that we need to do a good turn daily, which is the scout slogan. So you know, there's a lot of history and tradition associated with uh, scouting. Uh, one of the nice things about scouting that really helps make it a resilient organization is how decentralized <clears throat> it is. There is a national scouting uh, organization, but uh, you know they they print the scout books and uh, you know run places like Philmont and national scouting camps. But you know, all across across the country, there are individual councils that are responsible for uh, scouting in either a state or a region of the state. Like, for instance, I'm in the Greater Alabama Council, which is responsible for the northern half of Alabama. That's a separate organization. And the camps that it runs, you know, it's responsible for and it owns. Uh, and then there's the district. And the district has its own operations. And finally, the troop. Uh, the troop, all of its property is run by its chartering organization. That's typically a church. Uh, there are some BFW uh, or you know, American Legion halls that will sponsor a troop. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a religious organization, but a lot, uh, a lot are. And the chartering organization really owns all of the camping gear and the physical assets of the troop. So that. Uh, uh, makes it very resilient. You know, when the national organization was uh, getting, you know, uh, uh, ad attacked by you know lawyers arguing decades-old abuse uh, scandals, you know, that didn't affect us locally at all. I mean, I think the national troop had to mortgage Philmont, or the national uh, organization had to mortgage Philmont to pay hmm. off, and you know, you know, the the bankruptcy that it had to go through, hmm. but. Um, uh, it really doesn't affect the local groups because they're all independent organizations, which means there's there's no single central point of control. It's all decentralized, and that really makes it more resilient to uh, to uh, you know against people trying to subvert the the organization. Like we've had uh, in recent <clears throat> years, there's been a change to allow uh, girls to participate in Boy Scouts. And, you know, some troops have embraced that and have had, uh, you know, allowed girls to join. Uh, others haven't. You know, I, I think there is certainly room for uh, boys to have boy only activities. I think it changes the social dynamics a bit when you let girls get included in it. Definitely. Uh, so, you know, but you know, different troops can do do what they want. They have the freedom to maintain a traditional boy only group or they can have a co-ed group. Do so, Girl Scouts let that, boys in? I don't know if Girl Scouts let boys in. Hmm. But, uh, you know, it... Yeah, I, I can't speak to that. I'm not very familiar with Girl Scouts and how they work. Hmm. Um, anything else in the history of Scouts? Um, no, I mean, that, that's a basic outline of you know, where it came from and how it was formed. Mm -hmm. And so, um, 
what do you have to say about the patrol method? What could we learn from it? What kind of principles are there that people could use in different contexts other than that? School, sports, mm -hmm. working with their kids, homeschooling, whatever. Well, I think the, the key lessons from the patrol method are uh, you learn more yourself personally when you have to teach other people. And that's one of the things that the patrol method does. It forces the older uh, boys to teach the younger boys their skills. Uh, it's an opportunity to work together as a team. You know, too often people are focused on their own individual excellence, which of course is a, a very good thing. But one element of how you use that individual excellence and put it into effect is how well you work with other people to cooperate with them, uh, you know, to create a team that is more capable than you know, the individual members on, on the team. And that's really what the patrol method uh, teaches you, how to take a group of people, how to organize it, how to be, you know, initially how to be a good follower and contribute to the goals of the patrol, and later on how to be a good leader and how to direct the other members of the patrol toward whatever goals uh, you're working on. So I think it really, uh, the patrol method uh, you know, not just in scouting, but you know, you you could introduce that or similar methods in any group educational activity and enhance the uh, the educational mission by uh, providing those opportunities for doing teamwork. And you know, you have to be careful to avoid what you were talking about earlier, the whole you know one person does all the work and the others just kind of goof off, uh, you know, sort of thing. But um, you know that. Uh, yeah, that's also the responsibility of a, a good leader to make sure everyone everyone gets engaged. Mm -hmm. And then do, well, with the way Scouts is set up, the merit badges and the rankings, um, so there's one person who might specialize in something, but there's overlap. And there needs to be, for example, if there's a military group out on a mission and there's only one person who knows first aid and that person gets hurt, well then everyone's um, up a creek without an oar. Um, bad, bad situation. Mm -hmm. Or if there's only one person who knows how to cook and the others don't know anything about it and they're um, infiltrating a country, they're undercover, um, and no one can cook, well, they're going to go hungry. So, well, one, one nice thing about scouting, everyone, at least everyone who's reached first class rank, has basic competency in all those areas. They know the basics mm -hmm. of first aid. They know how to cook. They know how to hike and camp and uh, you know, pack their backpack and pick a good campsite and set up a shelter. Um, but then you know, beyond that, yeah, people will specialize in what they're interested in. And you'll have some uh, some boys who want to do wilderness survival and learn how to go and live off the land and build a shelter from naturally occurring materials. And but one of the requirements for the wilderness survival badge is you have to spend a night sleeping in a shelter that you constructed. Only one night? Which is, I'm sorry? Only one night? O only one night. They're, huh. they're not hardcore enough to make it more than that. Did but, it used to know. be more? Did it used to be like a week or two days or something? Do you know? I, I don't know. You know, I, I did not get to participate in scouting as a youth for a variety of reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, so I don't, I don't have a lot of experience or knowledge base to know how scouting used to be decades ago. You'd probably know more about it than, than, uh, uh I would. To some extent. Uh, one, of the, yeah. one of the things I've enjoyed about scouting though, as an adult is, you know, the opportunity to learn all of these scouting lessons as an mm. adult so that I'm there available uh, either to teach and direct Cub Scouts or serve as an advisor to Boy Scouts. So I've completed uh, uh, you know, a, a wide variety of training. I did some wilderness first aid classes, so I'd be ready to, mm. to be kind of a, you know, a first responder. I mean, in, in most first aid classes, you're basically learning 
uh, you know, what do you do in, you know, the five or 10 minutes it's going to take the ambulance to arrive to make sure things don't go south any further and, and, you know, keep matters from getting worse. In wilderness first aid, you have to be worried about, well, how many hours away are you from the trailhead? And, uh, you know, how can you keep someone going for a few hours and build a stretcher to take them out? Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's actually a little more involved in the conventional first aid. But Yeah, hypothermia, uh, dealing with hypothermia, dealing with someone who could possibly have a broken neck, trying to have fun dealing, learning how to do that. you got to be, like, super careful. Um, it's like, God, you got to be so careful about how you roll someone over if you need to. Yeah, that, that's something, yeah, Wilderness First Aid had a big section all about, you know, how do you stabilize someone's neck when you're trying to roll them into a stretcher to carry them out? That's something they would never teach you in a conventional first no. aid class because no. you have no business moving someone with a potential yeah. uh, broken neck. You wait for the paramedics to do it. Because that could paralyze someone for life. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, a lot but, of interesting uh, stuff. Yeah, there, there's a lot of great uh, adult training that you can get as a scout leader. I went and I completed what's called the wood badge Program. So I, I picked up some uh, you know, wood badge beads cool. that I get to wear on my uniform as a, a scout leader. The, the story goes that uh, when uh, Baden Powell was first starting to, to figure out how he was going to train scoutmasters, he set up a training class and uh, you know, wood badge kind of walks you through the scouting experience and forces you to work with adults in the patrol method to solve scouting and leadership challenges. And then you have to complete, you know, after you complete the coursework, you have to go and complete kind of like an Eagle project to help your scouting unit. You have to, to make some kind of an impact, uh, you know, enhance the program, you know, solve a bunch of goals in order to, to earn your wood badge beads. Hmm. But uh, the, the beads are, at least the original beads were supposed to have come from a belt that he had taken from an African chieftain that he had uh, defeated in battle. And he took it and started distributing the wooden beads off of it, you know, as a a mark to the leaders that they had passed uh, the class. So that tradition Hmm. uh, is alive today too. Hmm. Um, So what are some of the lessons that, what are some examples? Do you have some like concrete examples from your experience about some of the, help the patrol method is like some ways you've seen the patrol method help people Mm -hmm. um, learn about, you know, individual kids about education, leadership, um, Mm -hmm. help parents learn how to deal with students better. Yeah. Well, it's just been amazing to me. uh, Like the last couple of scout meetings I've been to, they were doing, you know, the boys were doing some really aggressive programs. Like last time we had an axe yard set up Hmm. and they were teaching axe and saw and hatchet work and safety. And I'm standing there kind of on pins and needles, just trying to make sure no one chops off a limb uh, as they're doing this. But, you know, the older boys were extremely responsible and we're teaching the younger boys how to how to stand and you know, how to swing the axe so that you know, if they lose control of it, the axe isn't going to go, you know, you know, collide with their their calf or their foot. Cool. Um, you know, and, and it was really encouraging to see how they stepped up and handled what could have been a very dangerous situation and did so very safely and very very uh, uh, professionally. I was very impressed with the maturity. Of the boy, well, frankly, was they did a lot better than I thought they were going to. Cool. Uh, hopefully, none of them are watching this, but uh, I, I was very proud of uh, how mature they were and how responsible they were. Uh, and you know, that's that's been pretty much a universal. They've uh, uh, you know, they they step up and they run the show. And if you get the right boys in as the senior leadership and they're working hard at it, they do an excellent job of putting on a fun program that uh, you'll know, make scouting fun, not just for them, but for all of the other boys in the troop. And that's a big one right there. The ax thing, learning to deal with the risk, which is pretty much eviscerated from 
Paul childhood nowadays? Not yeah, with that, everybody, but used to be people would learn how to deal with risk. Now it's like there's no way they can learn how to deal with physical risk. So, heck, they're, I mean, people when they're quote unquote older already have trouble and they're at risk of falling down, breaking a hip, and they can go in the hospital and then end up passing away, some of them. Um, it's going to be even worse just with these people who are just clueless about risk. It's taken away from the playgrounds, taken away from everyday life, all this helicopter parenting. Um, so right there, they need risk, and they're learning how they can deal with deal with it, and they how to deal with it that they're competent, they can be safe. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, and that's and that's really a big part of scouting. It's yeah. dealing with those kinds of uh, risks. You know, some of the risks are small. You know, the, the guy in your patrol who's responsible for your uh, your dinner, did he actually buy remember to buy the food? Did you remember to check at the trailhead to be sure he brought the food? I mean, if, if mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't work, well, you know, everyone's going to have to share and have half rations for dinner. Um, you're down to like swimming. We did a, a hike into a remote canyon where there was a spring fed pool and, you know, the scouts went uh, swimming in the pool. But of course, they set up and had a couple lifeguards and a couple adults backing them up uh, to make sure they they stayed safe. But, you know, that kind of an activity uh, where you're trusting them to monitor and understand the the safety and, and the health risks like most campouts. And I, I hadn't really appreciated this until I took the wilderness first aid class. The one piece of that medical training that came in most handy for me was heat exhaustion, hmm. because we would have hmm. scouts, uh, you know, even Cub Scouts, every single camp out start suffering from mild forms of heat exhaustion. And once you knew what to look for, you know, the scout sitting there, I don't feel good. I'm whining. I want to go home. <laughs> well, have you had anything to eat? I'm not hungry. Are you well, why don't you drink some water? Why well, I'm not thirsty. When, when's the last time you had anything to drink? Well, I haven't had anything to drink today. Well, aren't you a little bit thirsty? No, I'm not thirsty. Here, hmm. try this electrolyte solution. And, you know, 15 minutes later, you know, they're up and running and, hmm. and playing nice. like nothing had, had, uh, had, had happened. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and it's a good experience for them to understand their limits and understand, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, th th they should be able to self-diagnose that once they've been through it. Oh, you know, maybe it would be a good idea for me to bring a water bottle and, and be keeping myself hydrated. And then to look, things like that. know what to look for in other people to help them learn to yeah. be helpful and benevolent and have a good human society, learn that it's got to be created. It doesn't just happen. It's not there like gravity. You can create a good society or you can create one that's not so good. Um, they learn to recognize that. They can help themselves, help others. Right. Well, you know, it, it's actually been a little bit embarrassing. I was uh, I, I met this woman uh, professionally and I started talking with her and I realized one of her pupils was dilated hmm. different than her other pupil. And that is a sign that someone is suffering a stroke or has some neurological damage. And so I, I, I took her aside and I, I said, you know, I noticed one of your pupils is dilated. Are you feeling OK? And you know, that, that could be a sign of a stroke and maybe you should go get that checked out. And it turned out she had had a stroke in the past. And hmm. that was just uh, hmm. that, that she always had that condition and she knew that. But hmm. uh, wow. uh but I mean that, that you, you learn to look for those kinds of things so that you can be aware when someone is having uh, you know health difficulties that might require some intervention. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of risk, yeah, you got to like know what you're doing. You can't just drink any water you want. You got to <laughs> make sure you have clean water, have some pills, boil it, right? Unless you brought water with you. When I was at Philmont, yeah, we were hiking, and sometimes you're at a cliff that's like I don't know. It's been like decades. I'm not remember exactly, but it's like 30 feet, 150 feet up. You know, you're hiking on these trails, and there's a cliff, a cliff right there. Or when we were in Arkansas, I think it was one time, we went into a cave, um, and you got to go through these tight passages and stuff. And one person was walking along and in the cave and scared, and he slipped and he fell down. And thankfully, he didn't like fall really far, but he fell down screaming, thinking he was going to fall like hundreds of feet, but he just fell like a few feet. 
but um, five or something um, mm -hmm. kind of slipped down. But um, all that stuff where you've got to really be mindful. You can't, as most people, tune out and be mindless when they're in a mall or at home. It's like nothing to look for and nothing you got to care about. You don't have to turn on your mind and be perceptually observant. But with what they're learning, if you teach it, with what the Boy Scouts are learning in situations like that, and people who do wildlife stuff, naturalist stuff, you learn to be more observant, and then you can apply that in situations when people are around to help avoid um, being the victim of a crime. Oh, not, absolutely. absolutely. Not that it's yeah, going to be a magic bullet, but one thing criminals look for is if you look them in the eye and you know them, sometimes it's over, they're not going towards you, they're gone. Once right. you know they're there, but as long as um, they think you don't know they're there, then they'll continue. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of books about it, but um, be observant. Well, make sure you're walking in certain places um, so you're out in the open. People can see you. Um, you're not isolated, things like that. Um, if people knew that, that would help. Yeah. Well, there's a definite element of personal growth and betterment in in scouting. I, I had one Cub Scout in particular who the first time he had an opportunity to go rappelling, he just could not go over the ledge. Hmm. And mm -hmm. the uh, the the climbing instructors are very good at being extremely persuasive. Uh, you know, they won't push you over, but they they do their best to talk you into it. And he just he was too scared. He froze up. He would not go down that rappel. He ultimately had to come down the climbing tower, hmm. and he felt really embarrassed because hmm. a bunch of his other uh, uh, pack mates and den mates were there. And the next year at summer camp, I saw him go up to the climbing tower, and I was a little concerned because I knew about, I remembered his past experience. He went up, and I saw him at the top, and he was clearly nervous, but he went right down over the wall and, cool. and rappelled on down, and I was so proud of that young man for overcoming his fear and successfully completing that. Because I'm sure it, it, it bothered him to have uh, refused to do that in front of his friends. And for him to go back and overcome that was uh, really kind of heartwarming to see. Yeah, and then in a lot of modern society, taking away that stuff right there, as you point out, is taking away room for growth. It's right. not always hurting someone's self-esteem. It's making them feel uncomfortable and knowing that there's something they need to work on and they will. That's what some people do. And if some have their self-esteem all heard about that, well, then there's more of an underlying issue that needs to be dealt with than right. that particular situation. And like this pseudo self-esteem stuff in the culture. Yeah. Um, of course, we've got to be careful with people when you care about them, but that's a different issue than some of the direction that, some aspects of the culture have gone on today. But, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's good. Like with the scouts, they get to learn, um, some good risk taking teamwork, actually having teams that are, everyone's confident and everyone does something. Mm -hmm. Um, as opposed to like, I mean, where are you going to get that in the classroom? You know, right. The teacher well, generally mm -hmm. leads, you just like shut up and follow. It's just memorization not a lot of work um, or you got some like BS groups that happen, some BS group work. But if you restructured it, um, homeschooling, private, public, whatever, maybe some sports, um, you could set it up right and develop it as the scouts do step by step so that they're actually able to, cause you can't just throw them into it either. You can't say, oh, okay, we're going to do some group work. Just suddenly do this. It's well, like that's, that's one of the advantages, uh, at least of a mature scouting program, because you, you have senior boys who've been scouts for four, five, six years, uh, and you know, they know how to do it, and they've seen it done, and they've been to summer camp three or four times, and you know, they can teach the younger boys exactly what to do and how to avoid whatever mistakes you know, they may have made. So... The, the kinds of projects that they can tackle, you know, like you were talking about an expedition to Philmont out in New Mexico to go hiking and camping for a week. Or, you know, there's a, uh, 
a camp called Northern Tier up in Minnesota. You know, you can go during the summer and do a, a canoe, you know, voyageur kind of outing, or you can go in the winter and snowshoe your way through the, the park and camp overnight when it's 40 below zero, uh, or down to the Keys and do scuba diving and uh, uh, water activities like that. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of very impressive, uh, uh, challenging projects and adventures that they get to organize and exe- execute and benefit from in scouting. Good. Um, then, yeah, there's one problem with modern education, though, in trying to have um, everyone in a group of the same age. Um, there needs to be some multi-age stuff, too. That's one thing they have to work around to improve the system, trying to find a way to do that. So you can have more experienced people. It's not always with age, but sometimes it is. The more fundamental would be mixed expertise groups. That's what's going on with some of the scouting, and that's what needs to be done in, like, schools to help kids be able to teach. Um, Mm -hmm. And plus, without so much social um, climbing and posturing going on, it'd be easier. It's much easier for someone 16 to teach someone 13 or 11 than someone else in the same class. Right. Um, yeah, with, b- being a little older automatically gives you a certain amount of uh, authority that you can use to establish a leadership. Or at least an excuse. It's like, oh, he's older. It's okay. Whereas it's in the same class, same grade, same age. Yeah. Um, and then that's, you know, people say they want to educate for the way the real world is. Well, um, Show me the company where everyone's the same age. Ha! Does not exist. That's not getting people ready for the real world. That's like... There, there are always people more skilled and more talented than you. And mm-hmm. there are always people less skilled and less talented. And yeah. You need to learn how to teach the less talented and how to learn from the more talented. And that's that's uh, one of the things scouting offers. And to have a boss who's 20 years older than you or 20 years younger than you. <laughs> yeah. Um. That can happen, too. But Montessori does that. They're good with having the mixed age groups where, under supervision, the older can teach the younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Any other, like, specific stories about students learning that you can recall right now in the patrol method or how the patrol method helped them in a way that nothing else has Mm. that you're aware of? Or any growth you've seen in the in the kids? Oh, I mean, there's there's always the. Uh, uh, it seems every time we go to summer camp, there is one, we find one or two boys who get homesick, and if we can just persuade them to stick it out, they end up actually enjoying the experience and being mm-hmm. glad that they came and glad that they you know didn't bail and have you know mom and dad drive to camp and pick them up. Um, Cool. And you're just seeing that kind of personal growth, you know, in uh, in the boys is, is very rewarding. One one of the things that's nice about Boy Scouts is uh, our troop has this as a very firm policy. I'm not sure how uh, uniformly applied it is elsewhere, but we try very hard to avoid having uh, the adults work with their own children. Because of you know, there's there's a potential for nepotism, but mm-hmm. it's really more a matter of giving the boys the opportunity to have to work as junior members of the team and have to approach other adults to get stuff done. Cool. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, sir. Would you sign this off for me? And and uh, you know, would you approve my scoutmaster conference for this rank? Uh, uh, I need to do this merit badge. Can you help me? Uh, you know, I, I have to satisfy this requirement on that merit badge. Can you run through what I did and confirm that I've met the requirements? It really gives them the opportunity to start learning how to work in an adult world and interact mm-hmm. with other adults so that 
you know, you know at, at school, the problem is they only interact with their peers and with maybe one teacher. In the scout group, they have to interact with all of the other adult leaders in, in different aspects of the merit bad, badges or other responsibilities. And I think that's that's a, a, a good growth opportunity. Yeah. And then for, um, for some who might not know, um, could you spell the word nepotism and say what it means? Oh, that's just uh, a nepotism. A spelling bee? You really <laughs> think a spelling bee? Uh, nepotism would be uh, N-E-P-O-T-I-S-M. Nepotism. <laughs> that's just showing showing uh, favoritism toward your relatives. And it's something that some people will okay. learn in history, social studies, um, in regard to some governments, some positions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and that'll come up sometimes in maybe sometimes in the military, someone being selected, even though they don't have the qualifications, um, it'd be a matter of nepotism. Someone's chosen just because they're a relative, um, and they should not be in that position because they're not qualified for that rank right. in the military. Right. Yeah. But, um, cool. Um, Some people could do some of that stuff with homeschooling, too. Some of the schools would take more systematic change, and they'd be very resi resistant to that. Um, well, a lot of know, scouting, scouting does have a program they call a lone scout program that you could pursue in a homeschooling curriculum. Oh, where... but I mean that, too. But I mean, like, someone in a homeschool, some parents or some parents working together with their kids could use yeah. some of this with their kids. That's what I meant. But oh, it'd be great. It would be great for a homeschool collective or co-op uh, where you've got uh, children from a variety of families coming together in you know, a group of, you know, half dozen to a dozen or so, uh, you know, forming a, a scout troop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it could be or a, a scout patrol rather. Yeah. You can just call it scout general generic or make up your own name. Follow the same principles, call it what you want. Boys, girls, different ages can still be involved yeah. doing nature study. You can, you know, the stuff's on the internet. People can look up their merit badges, see what their requirements are, adapt it the way they want. Like a homeschool group, a parent could adapt it the way they want. Or a parent doing something with their kids or a group of parents outside of school. Um, it doesn't have to be part of the scouts. Just officially, the stuff's up there. You can look at the ranks, the merit badges, get your kids involved in doing that, Should make have them, as part of it, part of the leadership thing, have them reach out and write to an expert in the area, a local expert in tracking, birding, fitness, or whatever, look up people, assess them, look up five people, go interview with them all, see which one you're going to use, then they're learning these as well, and then they can decide on one, and then maybe the group uses that fitness person or tracker to help them learn something. Um, there's a lot of things like that they could do to apply these principles in different ways um, for their children. And there are a lot of other uh, scouting-like organizations that use very similar hmm. principles, like uh, uh, Trail Life USA hmm. is one uh, that... Uh, for people who don't want to be involved in Scouts BSA and, and some of the the political aspects that they've been getting themselves into, there are any number of other organizations that operate under similar uh, uh, provisions. Hmm. Interesting. I didn't know that. Makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, one thing I wanted to make sure I got in was, uh, you know, at, I am a scout leader, but I am speaking on my own behalf with my own opinions, which are not necessarily those of uh, Scouts BSA or my council or district or troop. So uh, they're, they're my opinions alone. Right. So maybe we should put like a disclaimer at the beginning, like a medical disclaimer or something. <laughs> or some uh, of them on some shows. The guest opinions do not... <laughs> 
The guest opinions do not represent those of Scouting USA, the President of the United States, this podcast, or your local school district. Yeah. But, um, cool. Any other ideas about the patrol method or principles about scouting or Montessori connections you need to make? Or do you need to, like, spend, like, hour 10? You need to run, get some other well, stuff I, done. I, I do have to be... Yeah. Getting back to my family Sweet. and some other Good. projects this evening, but uh, it's been a great opportunity getting to speak with you. Yeah, again. likewise. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm busy at work. The, the first half of my physics book is now off in the uh, the reviewers in the beta readers' hands, Sweet. and the Good. second half will be uh, you know, hopefully a few more months. It's taken way longer than I thought, but uh, when I have that done, I'll be looking forward to coming back and talking with awesome. you about it. Sweet. Yeah. Likewise. Sweet. I like the beard. It's nice. Oh, I, I figured, uh, you know, being quarantined for the plague, I had to kind of act and look the, the part. That's what my brother's doing. My brother had a beard and then he cut it off. But then he found out the company says they're not going back until like September. So he started growing it again. I was up. He does, I'm hoping he does like the ZZ top thing. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would take a while to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at my growth rate, and you know, it, it, it's a, <laughs> week, a decade before I have hmm. a, a, a a really respectable beard. I should have started sooner. I have to work on that. But first thing, I'm like, and when I get it, I'll show you. I'm like doing a hair thing, um, COVID quarantine hair style thing um, that I'll you'll know about when it grows long enough and all that. But I'll see how long I do that. Then maybe I'll try the beard thing too. But one thing at a time. Plus the two wouldn't mix. With what I'm doing, I can't do both. I couldn't do a beard and this. So, yeah. But um, cool. Any last words for folks uh, before we stop? Oh, well, just uh, scouting has been a great and worthwhile experience for me and my family. And uh, a good way to get some outdoor experience in a structured format that's hard to get any other way. So I recommend it. Yeah. I think now that you mentioned some of that, looking back, I think those are some things I get out of it. Um, working with other people, other people, my age, getting things accomplished, getting goals done, working with adults. You know, if I wasn't such a doofus when I was young, I would have gotten more out of it, but being kind of a doofus, um, didn't get as much out of it as I could, but, um, I can see some of that now looking back and, um, and so people know, I mean, some people have heard about it, but just as a reminder, what the Eagle Scouts, aren't there like some of the astronauts were Eagle Scouts and maybe some Navy SEALs and people like that? Yeah, it, it's a great youth training. There are scholarships available for Eagle Scouts. I understand that uh, if you are enlisted, it's usually at least like a full rank promotion once you finish boot camp hmm. uh, if, if you're an eagle scout hmm. wow. so uh, there, there are a lot of life advantages to being part of the eagle scout fraternity hmm. cool but those are some things i was thinking about mentioning earlier i just forgot don't want to like prolong the conversation since you need to go i just wanted to like mention that really quickly so so i mentioned it we're done okay so okay thank you hans appreciate the um discussion about the patrol method how it can help people um really valuable thing but uh thanks and hope you have a good day enjoy the time with your family and look forward to talking with you again will do uh, always a pleasure michael and uh, i'll look thanks. forward to continuing the conversation on a different topic some other time awesome thanks thank you for listening folks again if you'd like the podcast and the episode maybe think about donating helping out spreading this to teachers, parents, principals, schools, um, help improve our culture, help improve your life, help improve that of your children or students, help local community, help our culture in general. Um, I'd appreciate it. So thanks for listening and stay safe and stay healthy and be a good rational animal.